Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 153 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, returning guest Barbara Malera, president of Harvesting History, shares the story of the Constitutional Convention and how a garden visit helped found a new nation. The plant profile is on butterfly weed, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with your host, myself, Kathy Jentz, who gives the last word on whether gardening is only for the rich. This episode of Garden DC, we're joined by returning guest, Barbara Malera. She is co-founder and president of Harvesting History, and we're happy to have you back again with us, Barbara. Thank you, Kathy. I'm happy to be back, and I am delighted to be able to share this story with all of your podcast listeners. It is my favorite all-time horticultural historical story. Mm, We are in for a treat. I can't wait to hear that. Yes, you are. (laughs) It's it's great timing, too, because I was going to say we're coming up on our um, Independence Day holiday in a few weeks. And I didn't know until I looked at the calendar the other day and figured out that we are very close to our 150th of the country itself. We're just a a few years away from that point. Congratulations. Yes, we are. (laughs) And I'm looking forward to our hundred. Well, actually, isn't it our 200 and... Oh, 250th. You're right. I'm totally off on my math. So uh, I was going to ask you if you remember the bicentennial from, that was what, 47 years ago? Oh, you bet I do. Absolutely. My husband was in the harbor in New York, policing as an auxiliarist for the Coast Guard, the harbor, which was filled with thousands of boats. Everybody there, a patriot and wanting to celebrate the birth of this nation. It mm. has a photo of it and it's an awe inspiring photo. And that was in Boston? No, that was in New York Harbor. Oh, New York Harbor. Sorry. Yeah. And so I remember as a little, I guess, elementary schooler going down to the National Mall for the Bicentennial for the fireworks and having to trudge with my, uh, I guess, pillow and blanket in my hand. Uh, We must have walked a few miles from where we had to park (laughs) to get us to get down there. You bet. You bet. It was quite a day, quite a week quite an event, well executed and very memorable. Yeah, that is a day blazed in my memory. And I think that the 250th will probably be similar. I certainly hope so. And so we had you way back on episode 45. We were talking about seed starting tips. We also talked about the rumored seed industry seed shortage because that was back in February 2021. Um, in the midst of the COVID pandemic and people were freaking out about not getting seeds or the seed orders were delayed. Um, So we had covered all that then. And that's uh, a little bit over two years ago. So I wanted to ask um, what has been happening in your business in the meantime? Well, a lot of the seed shortages, I think, have been mitigated. Um, I think there are things that will forever be in short supply because they're being grown by independents. And so the quantities are uh, very small. But in general, the things that most people grow on an annual basis, I think, are available now. Good to hear. Yeah, it seems like the supply chain delays in not just the seed industry, but every other industry seem to have uh, opened back up now. Yep, you're right. Yeah, I can see this. the store shelves are much better stocked, you know, from the grocery store to our local garden centers. It's it's much more full looking, and that's always good to see. It sure is. It's comforting and lessens the stress enormously. 
Mm -hmm. And I know you do a lot of uh, garden shows, home and garden shows, outside gardening festivals. Um, Do you have any planned for this summer that readers or listeners can find you at? Not this summer. Um, We'll finish our last show, which will be the the Newport Flower Show, which will start on Friday of this week and go through Sunday. And then after that, we work on um, garlic and fall blooming bulbs and then the fall planting bulbs until we start again at the National Antiques and Garden Show in January. Hmm. And so if people are getting orders into you, they can still order last minute summer seeds, right? But what do you want them to focus on? Well, we always have a quantity of the, um, let's say, enduring seeds. We, we always carry seeds. We don't clear our decks and um, say, wait until next year. But the things that they should be thinking about, and, and there are, are two different things. First of all, I encourage people to think about the fall blooming, not planting, fall blooming bulbs, and they should start ordering them now. They're available to order in June, July, and August. You plant them when you receive them in August. They will bloom end of September, early October. And they literally are nothing you've ever seen or experienced in the fall garden. It's worth every gardener's little bit of effort to plant some of those fall blooming bulbs. And they're crocuses. You know this, Kathy. They're mm-hmm. crocuses and they're cold cheekums uh, that actually adorn the fall garden like nothing else, including chrysanthemums. There's nothing like these. Uh, You can only order them in June, July, and August because their shelf lives are very, very short, usually two to two and a half weeks. So most garden centers do not carry them. You pretty much have to order them online. And then as far as seeds, you want to think about starting beets, uh, lettuce. You want to start fall peas. Um, A lot of the root vegetables like turnips, as well as I just mentioned, beets, and even uh, mid-July, maybe some broccoli for the uh, fall garden. All those seeds can be planted sometime in July or August, and um, they'll yield you a mid to late fall crop. Very nice crop. Yeah, that's a great point because in the heat of the summer, none of us are thinking about planting bulbs in August (laughs) to have our beautiful fall garden. But I am in love with especially the Sternbergia, um, the yellow, tall, thin crocus looking thing that's called the fall daffodil, but no relation at all to daffodils. But that's one of my favorites. And have you grown water lily crocus? Yes, that's so gorgeous. And um, I was going to say not inexpensive. It's a it's a large bulb, you know, almost as large as an amaryllis bulb. Right, right. Very true. But um, usually from a single bulb in the first year, you get two to three flower spikes. So even though it's one bulb, you're not getting one. Usually you're not getting mm-hmm. one flower spike. And um As far as I'm concerned, water lily crocus is opulence personified. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing like it. Yeah, and I just love to buy one or two and put them on a, like, decorative plate or saucer in the window and just let them bloom and then plant them afterwards. Exactly. They're incredible because they grow at elevations of three to 5,000 feet. Um, largely in places like the Caucasus Mountains in the Middle East. And um, they have adapted so well. They need to flower. So before they shoot roots out, they flower. And that allows them the whole entire variety to continue to exist because it flowers before it shoots roots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nature's so fascinating that way. It's got its all its energy stored in that bulb itself so it doesn't even need that uh rooting or being planted in the ground or watering for that matter no oh very true and and they're i mean they're an exercise in survival when you think no soil so no nutrition and like you said no water and yet they produce these beautiful blossoms in in something like a an empty bud vase or on a saucer Mm mm-hmm Amazing. Once again, you're in awe of nature. 
Yeah. I mean, if you want to get them to do so again next year, of course, you will need to provide them with soil and nutrients and water. But yeah, that first uh, almost forced blooming, we could call it, um, is pretty cool to watch. And something you could probably share with kids or grandkids, that would be a fun thing to do. It's a great learning experience. And it it is true. If you put them in the ground after they've flowered, they'll flower for you again the following year and maybe even have multiplied gently, like maybe have doubled, um, mm-hmm. uh, not necessarily so. But the great thing about them is that they're deer and critter resistant. It's not like you're planting a tulip and it's a war with the squirrels or the tunks. Hmm. Oh, I hadn't even realized that. So good to know that that's one of the more deer resistant bulbs. It certainly is. Hmm. And anything else happening um, as far as sales or anything for Harvesting History? Um, we're, we are doing unusually well. Um, we've had sort of a heartwarming experience. Um, any of your listeners who have seen our videos will say, oh, for sure. She's got the worst YouTube videos on YouTube. But they are appealing to a broad audience that just wants the facts. Just give us the facts, ma'am. We don't care how you feel about putting your hands in the dirt. We just want to know how to do this in as quick a way as possible. And so not just all over this country, but frankly, all over the world, we have been getting comments and responses that please give us more videos. And we've been getting a large part of our business from these YouTube videos. So for all of us that are working on these videos, and they are the worst videos on YouTube, um, it's it's been very gratifying to see that there are people out there that really want to learn how to be gardeners. They don't have this information or they don't have access to the instructions that would teach them with all their questions. So we're just delighted. We're just happy to have this whole population of people that apparently love us bad YouTube videos and all. (laughs) Yeah, there's something to be said with unpolished, you know, just raw information that it doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to be full of wisdom. Right. That's exactly right. (laughs) Well, that's great to hear. So let's talk about your story um, that you're going to share with our listeners. And it has to do with that constitutional convention that happened way at the founding of our country. And for those who um, are listening from outside the United States of America, uh, maybe this will be um, a little history lesson too for them. Well, I certainly hope so. I, I need to give credit where credit is amply due. And that is the inspiration for the story I'm going to share with all of you today comes from a magnificent book. And Kathy, I think that you have shared it in one of your book club um, events. It's by Andrea Wolf, who happens to be a Brit. And the book's name is The Founding Gardeners. And the facts that I share today came from a story that she tells in her book, The Founding Gardeners. If your listeners have not read this book, they should. It is a wonderful, wonderful compendium of just what happened and how inspired our um, founding fathers were by the land that they farmed for the most part themselves. Yeah, it's a wonderful book and so are her others. And for those who are listening, it's Wolf with a U, -U W-U-L-F, if you look that up online. And, And we'll have a link to it in our show notes as well. Great, great. So I'd like to get started, Kathy, and I'd like to tell your listeners that our story begins in May of 1787, and you need to have a little bit of background information about this. The Constitutional Convention delegates gathered in Philadelphia starting on May the 25th of 1787, and it was going to be their responsibility to convert the independence that they had won into a country with a constitution. And the country's name was going to be the United States of America. Now, the background to this is that sometime during late May of 1787, an unprecedented heat wave 
fell on the city of Philadelphia and I guess most of the Mid-Atlantic. These delegates were locked in a hall and because they were fearful of spies, all the windows were shut. The men were wearing layers of cotton, linen, and wool, plus they all had wigs on. And during the course of these contentious discussions, some were nearly overcome with the heat. Now, in attendance, there were 55 delegates. The oldest was 81, and that was Benjamin Franklin. And the youngest was 26, but I don't know who that individual was. Of the 13 colonies, 12 were in attendance. Please note that Rhode Island had boycotted the Constitutional Convention. Hmm. So they had been at this for just about five weeks by the end of June. And the delegates, with fierce arguing, sometimes unpleasant words, we would be more graphic, but I'm not going to be in the course of this story. Those delegates had been able to agree on only one point. Your listeners, Kathy, all these 55 delegates had only been able to agree on one point after (laughs) five weeks. Sound familiar? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Sounds very familiar to those inside the Beltway. Well, the government of the United States of America that they had agreed should have three branches. This was the point they all agreed upon. It should have an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch. Now, the source of the contention, and it was mighty, the contention, was power. So what's new? It was power. The large states wanted power to be determined by population. The small states wanted each state to have equal power through one state, one vote. The fear by the small states, and it was a genuine and legitimate fear, was that in in cases of decision-making, the large states could always rule because if everything was done by population, the small states would never be able to grow to overcome the population issue. So this was a contention, and no one had been able to see any way to compromise on this. So on Thursday, July the 5th, and for your listeners, Kathy, this is a little bit of a complicated story, so I need for all of you to be with me. We're at Thursday, July the 5th, 1787. The Connecticut plan was introduced as a compromise. The Connecticut plan said, okay, the legislative branch will have two houses, not one. It will have a House of Representatives where distribution of power would be apportioned by population, which means in the House of Representatives, the large states would have significant control because population in the House of Representatives would be the source of power. A Senate in the second house would be created where each state would have two votes. So the Senate worked in the favor of the small states. In this case, each state would have two votes, regardless of the number of people that the state held within its boundaries and represented. So the House of Representatives, the distribution of power would be apportioned by population, thus favoring the large states, and a Senate where each state would have two votes and that favored the small states. That was the compromise. Well, we're at July the 5th now. The group agreed to argue the merits of the plan from July the 9th, which was a Monday, through July 13th, which was a Friday. 
and then they would gather on Monday, July the 16th, to vote. So think about this. They're going to argue in the heat, and this heat wave had not broken, in the heat of this horrendous heat wave for the five days of the week of July the 9th. And then they were going to vote on Monday, July the 16th. Hmm. Well, as it turns out, many of the delegates were staying at the same boarding house in Philadelphia. And at dinner, they had all gathered on Friday 13th. And one of the delegates said he was going to go to Bartram's garden tomorrow morning. And would anyone like to join him? Well, it turns out that a number of the delegates, I think it was, I believe it was 12 in total, said, yes, they would like to go. It would be nice to get out of the city. And even though the heat wave was still prevailing, it it would be nice to feel the breeze. Let me tell you a little bit about Bartram's Garden. Bartram's Garden had been founded by John Bartram, the father. He had at one time been the royal botanist to the King of England. But his passion was in understanding and promoting the flora of the United States. And he had a pretty active business. He actually created the first seed catalog in 1781. And with that seed catalog, he had been become fairly well known throughout the British Isles and also throughout Europe. He had two sons, William and John, and together they would go on collecting trips throughout the entire area that was the colonies of the United States. They collected plants and trees and shrubs from all 13 colonies, and they grew them in their garden, their extensive garden in Philadelphia. Well, they did have a garden that represented the plant life of all 13 colonies. And John had created a garden that sat on the banks of, I believe it was the Schuylkill River. And in that garden, he had an upper garden where he had three rectangles, one with vegetables, one with newly started plants, and one with flowers, all from the 13 colonies. And then below that, he had created paths that meandered along the banks of the river that passed by ponds that he had created. And all of the trees and shrubs in that sort of forest environment that he created were from the 13 colonies. The garden had become famous, and these delegates decided that they wanted to go and visit it. So, and I want all of you to laugh a hearty laugh at this, because like most politicians, totally oblivious to what the world was real was really going on, they set out from Philadelphia and arrived at Bartram's Garden at 6 a.m. in the morning of July the 14th. Okay. Thankfully, the Bartrams were used to, shall we call them, eccentric behaviors from famous personalities. And what and it was actually um, William Bartram that was in the gardens doing some gardening work when the carriages pulled up in front of his house. He left his duties and he went to greet them. And they told him that they were there to visit in his garden. And he proceeded for the next couple of hours to take them on a trip through the flowers and fruits and vegetables and trees and shrubs of all 13 colonies. He showed them the upper beds first, and then he took them on a long strolling walk and showed them how the tall, tall conifers and deciduous trees that were native to the Northeast protected the more fragile shrubs and plants that were native to the Southern states. And he showed them how those shrubs and plants from the Southern states protected the roots and bark of those northern conifers and tall, tall deciduous trees. Hmm. 
he kept emphasizing to them over and over again that most of the plants that they had in this garden in Philadelphia could not survive except through the cooperation and support of their neighbors. So the northern trees couldn't survive without the southern shrubs, and the southern shrubs could not survive without the northern trees. And he, over the course of almost six hours, spent time with them, showing them what they had. And just as an aside, Kathy, there is a yellow wood tree in Bartram's garden. It's the oldest plant in the garden today. This yellow wood was a sapling that our founding fathers saw when they visited Bartram's garden. If you ever have the opportunity to go to Bartram's garden, take a long look at that yellow wood tree because our founding fathers saw that tree as a sapling. Oh, and I've forgotten an important, important point. On the evening of July the 13th and the morning of July the 14th, the heat wave broke. Let, let me say that again, because this is an enormous factor, I think. The heat wave broke and broke suddenly and broke completely. So when these gentlemen traveled in the carriages out to Bartram's garden, they were refreshed and the stress was eased in their minds and their bodies because they no longer were struggling with the, the tremendous heat. The mm -hmm. cool breezes that were dew laden were dew laden was what they were feeling. So let's fast forward to Monday, May the 16th. And in that still fairly warm room in uh, Philadelphia, most of the delegates assembled. They were expected to vote. They were expected to stand when their state was called, give their name, and then vote I in favor or no against. So of the 13 colonies, we already know 12 were supposed to be present that Rhode Island had boycotted. So that's where we got to 12. But then in the ensuing weeks before this vote, New Hampshire hadn't arrived yet. So there was no vote from New Hampshire. And in New York, only Alexander Hamilton had arrived. And the other two delegates from New York, because they were not there, New York had no quorum, and so New York couldn't vote. So here's, here was the lay of the land. They needed either to pass or to defeat. They needed six votes. They needed a simple majority of six votes out of 10 colonies slash states that were in attendance. So what happened? Well, they began the voting with Massachusetts. And I need to step back for a second and tell your listeners, Kathy, the three names they need to remember are Caleb Strong from Massachusetts. He was on the trip to Bartram's Garden. Then Hugh Williamson and Alexander Martin, both delegates, the two delegates from North Carolina, were also on the trip to Bartram's Garden. All three of these delegates were from large states that voted together as a block and had never, let me repeat, never voted out of the block. They were large state delegates and they voted with the large state. So they began the first state that was called, the first colony was Massachusetts. Massachusetts had four votes. Two of the delegates got up and voted no. The third delegate got up and voted I. And then Caleb Strong got up. He voted I. 
So you had two delegates voting no with the large states and two delegates voting aye with the small states to pass the Connecticut Compromise. Because the vote was split, Massachusetts' vote did not count. We're now down to nine. We need five votes in order to pass or to defeat the Connecticut Compromise. Mm -hmm. So what happens next is that they keep calling the various states slash colonies. And the seventh state is called, and that's Virginia, probably at that time, at that moment in history, the lead large state. Virginia got up, and as had been expected by all, Virginia voted no to defeat the compromise. By the time Virginia voted, all the small states had voted, and they were four in number. So you had four that voted I, four states, and you had three already that had voted no to defeat it. Well, at that point, you had only three states left, and those states were North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. North Carolina was, kept, was called next, and Alexander Martin got up and voted a totally unexpected I. And then Hugh Williamson got up and voted an unexpected I. Now, what Andrea Wolf says in her book, at that moment, a cloud of silence must have floated across that room as all of the 55 delegates realized that the totally unexpected Connecticut plan had passed that the United States of America was going to be a nation because a simple compromise, the power of it and the significance of it had been realized by a group of well-meaning men who loved their nation or what was to be their nation more than their individual states or their their individual selves. We'll never know. We will absolutely never know whether that trip to Bartram's Garden and seeing how all of these plants from all 13 colonies survived only because of the support they got from each other. We'll never know whether that had an impact on these men. Many of us believe that the combination of the weather and the heated arguments and the turmoil and what was going on in their individual states and a bunch of other factors, those things were cleared away when a heat wave broke and the morning dew and the cool, fresh airs helped them to finally think clearly. But what we do know, Kathy, and, and this is the part, and, and I have to tell you, every time I tell this story, I get choked up at this point. What we do know is that when Caleb Strong and Hugh Williamson and Alexander Martin dramatically changed the way they had voted throughout their entire professional existence, when these three men who had all been to Bartram's Garden when they changed their vote, they changed 13 quarreling, sometimes viciously quarreling colonies, soon to be states, into what we all know has become one great nation, the United States of America. What do you think, Kath? Mm, lovely. And... I do think, obviously, that that visit had a serious impact on those three minds. And, you know, as you said, 
it could have been just the break from the routine and getting out to the garden. But of course, um, I think it gave them plenty of food for thought and then maybe a little bit of time to get to know each other better as well. I agree. I, 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 in my own mind, based on the times I've gone to the garden to clear my head and pulled so many weeds and probably said a few foul words as I was, um, I know how gardening can clear your mind and how watching things grow can, can just make you a better person. Um, uh, someone who realizes the community in which you live when you play in the garden. Mm-hmm. And I think we can all remember, you know, field trips, uh, those days back in school where we finally broke out of the classroom, got to have a break from our routine. And then for adults, that would be, you know, maybe the annual vacation to the beach. Um, just a change in circumstances uh, can really do something to change the way you're thinking. Oh, it sure can. It sure can. And they went on to write a great constitution a, a, a magnificent document for humanity. And uh, we have, we still have a great country, even today with all of our challenges. Mm -hmm. And I did have the privilege last summer of visiting Bartram's Garden myself, finally, after years of trying to, every visit up to Philadelphia, trying to get over there. Um, it's not the easiest place to access these days as far as um, getting there from the center city. Um, especially if you're going by transit or something else like that, but it is free and open to the public. Um, it is uh, centered, you know, right there on the river and just a gentle slope down to it. Um, so that's a surprising location to me, how close it was to the water. Yeah, it, it, it was to me too. What One thing that your listeners should know, it's just a little piece of trivia. One of the... Uh, the board is credited with having um, uh, scientifically described many, many plants that we have in the country today. Um, not as many as Lewis and Clark, but certainly quite a few. One of the extraordinary things they discovered was a, in the Magnolia family, and it is a, they named it after Ben Franklin. It's a Franklinia alatameha. Mm -hmm. And we all know Magnolia's they bloom in June or May. They're early bloomers for the most part. But the Franklinia alatameha, it blooms the week that the Constitutional Convention formed its compromise and was successful. And if if you go that week, that those middle weeks of July, you will see it in that garden. The extraordinary thing is the Franklinia is only native to a tiny area in Georgia. It's, I think it's no more than two acres that mm -hmm. this plant grows in. And, and to think that, that every year at the time that the Constitutional Convention uh, compromise was met, that, that plant <laughs> marks that significant event by blooming. Hmm. I've always been envious, Barbara, of... Uh, when I see a Franklinia in a private garden, I've seen it in several public gardens. Um, it's very similar in look to a Stewardia yes. or a miniature white magnolia. If people can picture that in their head, maybe like a little dogwood tree that has small magnolia type blossoms is pretty much the size of the tree and the extent of the blooms. But yeah, it's no longer um, in the wild. It's, it's only a cultivated plant, and it's known to be a very um, fickle plant, we'll call it, <laughs> uh, in the garden. So if you can get one, obtain one, and keep it alive, you're, you're ahead of the game. And, and I would suggest that you're best trying to find the Franklinias in the Philadelphia area. Um, I, I don't know if um, some things that are offered may appear to be Franklinias and possibly aren't, but I would, I would feel very comfortable um, if you were looking for one to look in the Philadelphia area. What do you think about that, Kath? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say mid-Atlantic and Philadelphia area uh, nurseries, 
um, tree nurseries in particular and specialists uh, would probably be the, the ones to go for. And then visit some um, at some of the local public gardens there. Um, so you can see one in its growth habit and what it looks like and what you're looking for. And it does have a little bit of a scent to the bloom as well, which is always nice. And I'm going to say something a little cheeky, Barbara. Okay. And this is about our founding fathers. So, you know, you can't, they didn't have potable water, you know, unless you boiled it and drank it that way. And most of them were drinking, you know, a glass of hard cider to start the day. And I can imagine in the heat, you're drinking more than a little, <laughs> right? You absolutely were. I'll bet you they were drunk three sheets to the wind that night they agreed to go out. Yeah. So that's why I always think of that. They, they always had like a low level buzz all the time <laughs> <laughs> and probably a little bit more than that when it was very hot out and with no air conditioning imagine that and um again didn't have bottles of water or water uh fountain there you're just drinking what's available and they couldn't take off those wigs off you know they had to keep the wigs on i'm sure they took those overcoats off but even even with that they uh and and when you think by the time they got to vote on the 16th of July, that heat wave had been going for eight weeks. Mm. Yeah, I don't envy them. And I'm glad they got it done. And I'm sure they're glad to have gone back to their uh, respective states after that uh, to cool off. And in our last few minutes together, Barbara, um, I wanted to turn the subject back to you and Harvesting History and ask how listeners could get in touch with you um, and to learn more. If they need to, if they actually want to talk to a human being, and we in, we encourage that at Harvesting History, uh, you can always get us at, the, the number is 410-627-6831. The website is harvesting-history.com. And the number to call if you've got questions or you need to discuss something is 410-627-6831. And we'll be happy to help you. We have decided as a strategy that we aren't interested in growing into a giant company. We have had so much pleasure in being a small company that has gotten to know our customers on a one-to-one -one basis. And that's part of the reward we've gained from having Harvesting History. Um, I, I laugh, and it's with glee, at the customer communications we get. We sell a lot of citrus trees, for example. I have baby pictures from more lemons and more limes than you can ever imagine <laughs> with, the, with the comment, my first lemon, my first lime. <laughs> we love that. Yeah, that must be so rewarding. And I was going to ask you, and I don't think we talked about it the first time we had you on the podcast, but why did you call your company Harvesting History? Well, uh, it's actually not a name that we thought up. We had um, a very dear man who was very interested in the work that we were doing. And one day he called and he said, I have this great idea. I don't know whether you'd be interested. What if you called your company Harvesting History and you had a tagline that said, Seeding the Future? And I knew then that was perfect. That's, that's what we do. We harvest what we know about the history of horticulture and agriculture, and we use that information to seed the future of what we hope are many, many gardeners. Excellent. And I know that your website has many of those stories related to the seeds and plants. And I thank you for sharing uh, one of your favorite gardening stories with us on this episode. And I hope to have you back again, Barbara. I'd love to come back again. But most of all, I thank you, Kathy, for allowing me to share this story. It's one that I think every American should know. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. 
Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A and polls has let me be more creative and taking the podcast to another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Butterfly weed, plant profile. Butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberoso, is a perennial plant that is native to much of the eastern and southern United States. It is also known as butterfly weed or orange milkweed. The flowers of butterfly weed are commonly orange or yellow. The blooms are a nectar source for many kinds of butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. The leaves are narrow and bright green. The foliage is a food source for the caterpillars of monarch, gray hair streak, and queen butterfly. Butterfly weed prefers to be planted in full sun and does well in poor soils. It is drought tolerant once established. It is hardy to USDA zones 3 to 9. It is deer resistant like other members of the milkweed family. However, it doesn't produce the milky sap that other milkweeds do. Butterfly weed can self-sow if allowed to go to seed, but it takes a few years for a new plant to flower. It has a deep taproot, so does not transplant well. It has a long season of bloom, making it one of our more showy wildflowers in the garden. It is also a good cut flower. Butterfly weed, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, we finally got some good rain and such a relief to have it. Blooming in my garden is a beautiful Stewardia tree. Over at the community garden plot, the zinnia seedlings are up and the borage is blooming over there too. Our June 2023 issue of Washington Gardener has been posted and that includes articles on Celosia, spring ephemerals in the summer garden. The owner of Chateau Coco, Daryl Lynn Strother, is profiled. We talk all about growing pole beans, the ethics of using ladybugs as pest control, a visit to the Three Sisters Gardens in Greenbelt, Maryland, diagnosing plant diseases, and much more. Some upcoming local garden events that you might want to attend include a talk I'm giving online for Politics and Prose Bookstore, and that is on Wednesday, August 9th at 6.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can sign up for that at politics-prose.com slash classes. And that's all about ground covers and my new book, Ground Cover Revolution. Also, want you to save the date for Saturday, August 26th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon at the Silver Spring Farmer's Market in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, Washington Gardener Magazine is bringing back our annual tomato taste that was on pause throughout COVID. And so we're happy to be back in person and be able to taste the various tomato varieties at the market, collect those votes, and announce the winning tomatoes. And we'll have some prizes and other surprises to give away. So hope you can join us for that. That is free and open to the public again on Saturday, August 26. Happy gardening!
In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Get low-maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book, Ground Cover Revolution, by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. This is Kathy Jentz, editor of Washington Gardener Magazine and host of the Garden DC podcast. I'm sharing my last word on, is gardening only for the rich? I've been engaged in several conversations, both online and off, over the last few months about barriers to gardening and how it is seen as being a rich person's hobby or pastime. This came as quite a shock to me because for years, I have felt the undercurrent of judgment that comes from gardening as something that was looked down on as somehow lower class and a task you hired others to do. So, which is it? Well, it's neither. Yes, it's a privilege to have access to your own land and the free time to nurture plants in it, but it is certainly not something out of reach of even those at the lowest rungs of the economic scale. In the recent book, The Urban Garden, which I co-wrote with Terry Spate, We take great pains to describe how gardening is accessible to all income levels, ages, classes, and ethnic groups. We describe how growing spaces can be carved out of even the tiniest city lot, balcony, or rooftop. The land you garden on need not be your own. It can be rented or bartered for. It can be a public garden where you volunteer. It can be at a school or workspace. Like any hobby, gardening can get pricey if you let it. You can certainly rack up credit card debt buying the latest rare houseplant or fancy gadgets, but you don't need those. You can garden with just a trowel, cloth gloves, and a pack of seeds from the dollar store. My personal take is that gardening is a wide world of types and levels of investment and interests, from the DIY hands-in-the-dirt folks to those with point and have plant staff and designer budgets. I'm not going to judge others and hope that others reserve their judgment as well. And that's the last word on Is Gardening Only for the Rich? by Kathy Jentz. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month 
by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.